Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Molly Ayushi, they pronouns. I'm a group facilitator at Galen Hope, who's an educational sponsor of Weight Stigma Awareness Week. I'm also a fat activist and scholar working on research around anti-fat bias and eating disorders. And it is my joy and pleasure today to welcome Angel Austin, who will be speaking to us uh, today. And um, a little bit about Angel before we get started. Angel, she, her pronouns is a black infinifat and disabled founder of Sacred Space for Fat Bodies. She is dedicated to the creation of and increased access to self-care experiences for super fat and infinity fat people, especially those who are black, disabled, members of the LGBTQIA2S plus community, indigenous, Latina, Asian, or members of other groups who exist at myriad intersections and who are substantially marginalized. She also fights to make their voices heard and for their overall well-being as they're often excluded from participation and representation in society and even within the framework of fat liberation. Her lived experience gives her a unique and relevant perspective and her goal is to build a solid community. Please join me in welcoming Angel. Hello everyone, so glad to be here. Um, um, I'm also the advocacy and community um, leader at ASDA and am representing ASDA today. Very excited to do that, uh, to share with you the history of Health at Every Size and the Association for Size, Diversity and Health. And I also want to just uh, quickly thank Sharice and everyone responsible for um, organizing these events this week. Um, I haven't had a chance to, to listen to any of the other um presentations, but I know that they're awesome. I know it was an awesome group that was assembled, and I'm so uh, glad that you counted me <laughs> worthy uh, to be part of such an amazing stellar group of speakers. Um, such a worthwhile effort and event. Thank you so much again. Um, today's agenda, we're just going to go over um, uh, our history, uh, as I stated, uh, from fat liberation to health at every size. Uh, to ask uh, why we needed uh, health at every size, how whiteness shows up in haze and the movement. Um, we'll talk about finding our breath, the drowning and undrowning of fat black folks in haze, um, transferring care, changing our commitment to care. And I'm going to share with you some resources. Um, I've already been introduced, so I'm going to skip that slide. Just include that in there. Um, Yeah, I'll skip that. <laughs> so our history from fat liberation to health at every size to as the. So just to give a brief uh, history from uh, fat liberation to haze to as the, we're going to do a quick rundown of the timeline. Um, so starting all the way back in the 1950s, we had the beginnings of the civil rights era. Um, 67 publishing of More People Should Be Fat by Lou Lauderback. Uh, who was an early pioneer in the fat acceptance movement. Um, 1969, uh, Fat In, I don't know if you ever heard of that, but it was held at Central Park to protest uh, fat bias. Um, our friend Bill Fabry, who's still very active um, in our communities, uh, kind of a staple, um, started NAFA in 1969. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with NAFA. Um, in 1972, Johnny Tillman, who I'll talk a, a bit more about later, uh, she named her intersectional oppression. Um, 73, we have the Fat Underground, which uh, was a group of radical activists, feminists, and lesbians that was created. Um, and the Fat Manifesto was published. Um, 76, we had the Fat uh, that. In 1976, fat black women became the face of welfare. Um, Reagan popularized them as the uh, welfare queens in his campaign um, and as in the mainstream uh, media as well. Um, in 1977, we had the Convey Collective. Uh, they published their, published their statement, transforming intersectional organizing and marking the second wave of black feminism. And in 1978, Susan Orbach published that fat is a feminist issue, uh, but it was from a white, then woman's 
lens. I'll talk, refer more back to that later. Um, Johnny Tillman was, uh, as I stated earlier, I mentioned her name earlier. I said I'd talk about her a little bit again. She was a prominent American social activist and feminist who played a significant role in uh, advocating for the rights and well-being of poor and welfare dependent women. Uh, she's best known for her work with the National Welfare Rights Organization or NWRO, uh, an influential grassroots organization in the United States during the 60s and 70s. And she said, I'm a black woman, I'm a poor woman, I'm a fat woman, I'm a middle-aged woman, and I'm on welfare. In this country, if you're any one of those things, you count as less of a human being. If you're all those things, you don't count at all. I just want to take a moment to hold space for those words and honor our ancestor, um, my ancestor, Johnny Tillman. Uh, so from starting in the 80s, um, we have Dr. Uh, sorry, RN, Lynn Miltish, NAFA's then medical advisor, and I might be butchering these names, y'all, please forgive me. <laughs> um, but they wrote the Declaration of Rights of Fat People in Healthcare. Um, in 89, we have the Fat Dyke Statement uh, that was published at the Fat Women's Conference in London. And during the early 90s, we have the early establishment of uh, what we call a, a Hayes Framework. Um, in 91, we have uh, Anita Hill, the Anita Hill trial, which some of us might remember because we were alive and we were there. I know I was. <laughs> um, and the beating of Rodney King by the police in LA, which will live in infamy, the horrible, horrible thing to see, to visualize, to have broadcast in the media. These were milestones of body terrorism and the relationship to um, compound oppressions. Um, 98, we have the Million Pound March Convention sponsored by NAFA. And then in 2003, 20 years ago, it's our anniversary, uh, as the created uh, to show up principles, as the was created to show up principles and framework around truly size, size inclusive care. And um, yeah, it's our 20th anniversary. So we're celebrating that all year. Um, 2008, the book Health at Every Size was published. And in 2012, 2012 uh, ASDA, we trademarked Health at Every Size. And we called attention to the need for more intersectionality in Hayes principles. Um, today, as it stands right now, our focus is centering the voices of the most impacted by the racist history of fat liberation and ways that our voices, my voices, these voices uh, of the most oppressed um, are centered. Uh, the, the ones who stand to be harmed the most by the medical industrial complex are centered. Um, simultaneously, there have been culture shifts around the idea that fatness and blackness are most definitely inextricably linked. I'll say that again. Fatness and blackness are inextricably, inextricably linked. And we have uh, this exemplified in the works of Sabrina Strings, Fearing the Black, Bar uh, Fearing the, Fearing the Black Body, that book we cannot recommend enough, and uh, Deshaun Harrison's uh, Belly of the Beast, also another book that are essentially required reading for anyone doing this work. So we want to answer the question why we needed help at every size. So um, just in a, to take a, like maybe I'm out a minute in the uh, chat, uh, as we move into this part of the discussion, I want you to ask, I want you to consider these questions that I ask. How do you define haze? And what does haze mean to you? Uh, take about a minute and um, just throw that in the, your answers in the chat. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So um, while fat liberation is most definitely a separate fight, 
uh, those who were in the trenches of fat liberation uh, realized that uh, there has been rampant, there was, and there still is, rampant ac lack of access to fat folks um, across the board, but especially in healthcare systems. Fat liberation activists pointed out the disparities in healthcare systems and advocated for equity within them. The issues that fat underground activists built awareness of remain true even now today and create a lot of harm to fat people, especially fat, black, brown, disabled and super fat plus folks. Uh, white led and white centric haze and fat liberation advocacy leave out the global majority. Uh, an intersectional liberatory approach led by black, brown, disabled and super fat slash infinite fat plus folks is necessary. It's absolutely necessary. Again, I say led, not, not tokenization, but we're talking about the leading of this approach. Again, uh, Belly of the Beast, required reading. Most definitely required reading. So um, let's talk about uh, suffocating whiteness. Let's break down this term. Uh, the common hindrance in the evolution of fat liberation and healthcare disparities for the most marginalized has been exactly that suffocating whiteness. And let's break down this term, suffocation, the feeling of being oppressed, uh, the condition and or action of dying from the obstruction of air uh, or of being unable to breathe. And whiteness, just to clarify, is not talking about white people per se. We're talking about whiteness as a system of ideologies, institutions, cultures, and beliefs that operate as the humanity standard of the world. Uh, it's an indoctrination, right? Um, the, the, humani the humanity standard of the world in which all those who are non-white and are marked as other are oppressed and dehumanized. Uh, those politically and socially recognized as white, white supremacist, capitalist, imperialist, patriarchy, anti-blackness, etc. Again, to be clear, we're not talking about white people per se. We're referring to the concept of whiteness as I've just defined it here. How are ways that whiteness has shown up in the Hayes movement? Uh, earlier when discussing the timeline, we referred to uh, feminism and liberation through a thin white lens. The same things happened with Hayes. There was the centering of the most privileged voices. There was a co-opting of ideas and concepts. Uh, space was taken up and unfortunately space is still being taken up. Um, so how are some ways that uh, whiteness has shown up in the Hayes movement? A historical eraser, uh, with language, um, representation, or the lack thereof, the political framework, uh, interpersonal violence, uh, a sense of being one dimensional, and a great lack of accountability. We'll talk more about these things later. Um, healthism defined is the social, social political ideology that health is individual and the moral, legal, um, political obligation to health. Uh, this is what we're talking about when we define healthism. And examples of sentiments that were expressed uh, and still are when talking about how uh, BIPOC folks are drowned out of haze. You have being fat is worse than being a black person. Fat is the last acceptable oppression. We don't want to derail haze by talking about race too much. Uh, fat activism and haze are often sidelined side -lined in favor of other issues. Um, there isn't room for me in this movement anymore. Uh, we see that a lot. Um, we have a contact um, option for our website, obviously, and people write in and say these types of things to us even today. Um, or I see no racism or violence and what happened when we have situations that occur in our community. Um, these are the ways that the harm that's done, the voices uh, uh, is, they're all drowned out. Um, 
of Hayes. Um, when these things happen to people who are BIPOC um, or who are otherwise marginalized. Let's talk about some um, overt or obvious examples versus more social, uh, socially acceptable examples of white supremacy um, that are the most insidious. So we have here obvious things like lynching, hate crimes, these are overt. Um, you know, uh, burning crosses, use of the N-word, racial slurs, uh, racist jokes. Um, things are uh, also more overt. Make America uh, Great Again, that's the dog whistle, obviously, for racism. Uh, the school to prison pipeline, Confederate flags. These are all things that are most, most obvious you can read there. Um, virtuous victim narr uh, narrative. Uh, denial of white privilege, but some of the more um, covert or more insidious forms are um, glorifying, for example, glorifying intention over impact, um, self-appointed white allyship, uh, even the celebration of Columbus Day, uh, which is something people are becoming more aware of, but don't even really think about. Um, again, around intention is assuming that good intentions are good enough. Um, just take a moment to read through these. And I'm sure that if you do some self investigation, you can find ways that you might have um, participated either in some of these things or things that are very much like these. Some of these things might feel harmful or harmless, I should say, or just things that you might not have ever thought of. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Okay, so let's go over a few characteristics of white supremacy culture. Um, these, again, there might be some things that you recognize here that you did not consider to be white supremacy. Um, if you feel like sharing or you're up to sharing, feel free to share in the chat. If there are anything on these uh, lists that you identify with or might be surprised by. Um, we have perfectionism. And I see this um, as in a way, especially with regards to uh, social media and things that I've shared uh, with social media, on social media, around, you say, for example, diversifying your feed or, um, you know, being truly inclusive, if that's what your intention is. Um, we tend to glorify appearances over substance or branding over diversity. You want what you do to, uh, to look good, which is perfectly fine, right? But if your intention is to truly um, be inclusive and diversify your feed, sometimes you're going to ruffle a few feathers, right? You're going to upset some folks, have people call into question your intentions, um, especially if you serve a particular market, right? And so that can be challenging. Um, another characteristic is a, a characteristic is a sense of urgency, um, defensiveness. Um, quality over, I'm sorry, quantity over quality, uh, worship of the written word. Um, this comes out in a lot of times where you have maybe a person, uh, a BIPOC person who posts something and you want to correct them immediately and uh, possibly make a big deal of it. That's white supremacy culture. Um, only one right way, um, paternalism, either or thinking, power hoarding. I'll talk about this a little bit more, but that does directly speak to the power uh, of privilege, right? Like the ability to give opportunity or to pay, for example, a fat black person to do work for you, but you um, want to make that money yourself. And so essentially you're taking up space from a person who has the expertise and lived experience or whatever the case may be, um, but you own the power and you're holding on to that power because it's what you want. 
and not um, giving the opportunities of people who should have them or making that space or centering those voices. Uh, fear of open conflict, um, individualism. I got mine, you get yours. I'm not gonna give or share or uh, do anything to support uh, people who deserve or who need uh, reparations or mutual aid or um, their voices to be heard, paid opportunities because I gotta get mine and they gotta get theirs. Uh, I'm the only one, uh, progress is bigger, uh, objectivity and right to comfort. Again, it's um, the idea that uh, I have privilege, I can you know, take care of myself and I can you know, thrive, not just survive, I can go on vacation, do whatever I wanna do. Um, and that's my right. Right, I don't have to look at, at the disparity. I don't have to consider the inequity. Um, I don't have to do any of those things because it's my right to be comfortable and live a comfortable life. And while to an extent that's true, to an extent that's true, um, if you are saying that you want to change things, make things more equitable, equitable in the world through your work, through your activism, uh, you need to challenge yourself in those areas. Okay, let's talk about finding breath in the midst of these um, of suffocating whiteness. So I'm gonna read this really quickly. Um, Those who survive the underbellies of boats under each other, under unbreathable circumstances are the undrowned and their breathing is not separate from the drowning of their kin and fellow captives. Their breathing is not separate from the breathing of the ocean. Their breathing is not separate from the sharp exhale of hunted whales. Their kindred, their kindred also. Their breathing did not make them individual survivors. It made a context, the context of undrowning. Please think about this in light of what I shared earlier. Uh, breathing is unbreathable circumstances. Breathing in unbreathable circumstances is what we do every day in the chokehold of racial, gendered, ableist capitalism. We are still undrowning. Instead of continuing the trajectory of slavery, entrapment, separation, and domination, and making our atmosphere unbreathable, we might instead practice another way to breathe. And that's from Alexis Pauline Guns in Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. We are most definitely at ASDA finding of, dreaming of, envisioning ways to practice another way to breathe, another way to live, another way to, uh, to thrive another way to change. So let's delve into commitment and accountability. And I want this to be um, a, a, a time of, of true uh, self-reflection and, um, and deep thought as we talk about these things. And please feel free to share your thoughts um, in the chat. So I have a question for you. Let's talk about COVID, uh, commitment and I'll ask, I'll ask the question. Uh, commitment as defined in Merriam-Webster is an agreement or pledge to do something in the future, the state or instance of being obligated or emotionally impelled, um, and we shall see the synonyms there, synonyms there, allegiance, attachment, constancy, dedication, devotion, faithfulness, fidelity, loyalty, piety, steadfastness. steadfastness. Um, you can answer this in the chat or just to yourself. What commitment can you make to change the landscape, right? And in your work, or whatever it is that you do 
help those who suffer most find breath. All right, community accountability as defined by the Andre Lord Project. Um, strategies aimed at preventing, intervening in, responding to and healing from violence through strengthening risk relationships and communities, emphasizing mutual responsibility for and addressing the conditions that allow violence to take place and holding people accountable for violence and harm. This includes a wide range of creative strategies for addressing violence as part of organizing efforts in communities when you can't or don't want to access state systems for safety. Um, we know the very obvious definition of violence, but I want to delve a little bit deeper and ask, what is violence? Again, it's not always overt, right? It's not always um, racism or white supremacy that's in your face. Suffocation as we defined it today through systems, through taking up space from others that affects their bottom line and their survival, that's also violence. And when you realize that you don't exist alone in this community, what does that mean to you? How, how are you, how are you taking up space? <clears throat> Self-accountability is a process we do with ourselves, for ourselves. When we are being accountable to ourselves, we're acting in a way that honors ourselves and our values. We are acting with consciousness and integrity by taking responsibility for who we are in the world and for living in alignment with our values. These are things that we at ASDA are, are posing to ourselves, discussing in leadership meetings all the time. As we do this work to make better the lives of those most impacted by the health industrial or the medical industrial complex, how are we accountable for showing up in our space? How are we accountable for the interactions that we have in our community? It starts with us as individuals, right? And when we do self inventory, how often do you allow your intentions to trump the impact of your actions? Uh, if your desire is to be inclusive in your practice, um, in your work, in the community or with your patients or clients, um, how do you check to see if that's really what you're doing? Who do you look to to consult? Who do you look to for leadership in these ways? If you're truly, if you're truly trying to make change in the lives of your clients and your patients, what are you doing? What could you be doing to prevent them um, the ones that are marginalized, the ones that are struggling in various ways due to the systems that they're affected by, what could you be doing to prevent them from truly getting what they need? How can you be accountable yourself? More on self-accountability from fumbling towards repair. Self-accountability is the basis for being accountable in all of our relationships. However, accountability does not require other people to be in process with you. If you've done harm, it's possible that you might inflict more harm if you try to include those who you've harmed. So sometimes it's, the buck stops with you, right? You can take accountability for things you have done or harm you have caused whether or not the persons impacted by that harm are able or willing to engage with you. In the work of self-accountability, we are constantly striving to align our actions and our values, knowing it's likely they will never exactly be the same. 
When there's a gap in that alignment, we can reflect on what choices we would need to make in the future. So our actions are more in line with who we want to be as organizations, as individuals, as medical or healthcare professionals. We can do this work. It's what ASDA has done in the history and the process of what we've done as an organization over the years. We, this has been our work. This has been our focus. Honoring the suffocated. I'm happy to be part of ASDA's leadership as an Infinifact Black woman. And I'm more, even more proud to say that our leadership is primarily, primarily 99% Black and we're all completely fat. And that's a huge deal because I will assure you that it has all, not always been this way, but we feel like this is the way forward. It's what we've prioritized it as the, um, and it's what we will continue to prioritize. We're moving in a direction of what we see that we want the future to be. And we want to align ourselves uh, with organizations and individuals who understand this and are make it also making it a priority. Reclamation of Hayes. Addressing race, gender, and class in our analysis of Hayes. So, um, liberation here, we are going to define it as a world where care resources, relationships, and access are abundantly available to everyone, no matter their identity, performance, presentation, body type, or lived experience. And into anti-Blackness, racism, uh, anti-fatness, colorism, transphobia, homophobia, ableism, classism, a systemic spiritual warfare, healthism, and body terrorism. That's what we are um, classifying as true liberation here at ASDA. So what is the role of health at every size and liberation? When I say I, when I say we believe it as the, that black, fat, disabled, anybody who has been most harmed by the medical industrial complex and oppressive systems in the world should be leading this work. Again, I do not mean that it should be about tokenization. I don't mean that you should find um, faces and voices that you can center when it's convenient. Um, I don't mean that they should, these organizations or that your work or whatever it is that you're going to do should be led in face and name only. Uh, here at ASDA, like I have already stated, we have black fat folks in positions of leadership that are making decisions that are moving this organization forward. And this is the way it should be. Reorienting as the work to be grounded in liberatory frameworks and led by those most impact, impacted by medical fat phobia. Uh, that's the role of health at every size and liberation. Repositioning Hayes as a framework of care, not as a movement in and of itself, um, remaining grounded in the larger liberatory frameworks. So the ultimate goals of health abolition are not lost in the immediate work of creating equitable, equitable access to our current care systems. A revision of our PDDP, that's, I'm gonna talk more about that later. Um, so all these things are what we have been doing to make sure that we are actually focusing on the voices um, and the people who have the lived experience and the education and the full package of what we need to lead this organization forward. Because when you create that access and you have those people, the right people on the bus, so to speak, um, you create room, you create space, you create the fulfillment of needs for everyone, everyone. So what is transforming care uh, as a, uh, a person who uh, has clients who is a, a medical professional or 
uh, another uh, healthcare professional. How can you change your commitment to care? How do you reach beyond comfort and challenge yourself to change your commitment to care? The focus must be on those most, again, most adversely affected uh, by the HIC or the MIC. Uh, as uncomfortable as it may be, and it will be, you must learn from those who live within multiple marginalized intersections. You must. Again, when you do this, you create much more a great expansive space um, that makes room and fills the needs of, of everyone who might come into that space. So here in this, this um, infograph, we see that um, it's a cycle and it should be ongoing. Um, and it's something that you should commit to, um, to uh, transforming and providing care, engage in political action to change institutional bias, policy, and access. What are ways that you can do that? What are ways that, what are resources? What are organizations? What are individuals even that you can reach out to, uh, to help you do that? Increase awareness of systemic oppression. Do you understand oppression and what it is and how it looks? Who can you reach out to to help you learn these things? Um, becoming aware of who you are your weak spots and how you show up in the world, down with perfectionism, down with individualism. If you recognize, when you recognize that there are areas that you can improve or learn, um, don't run away from them, don't shun them. Realize that these are, are areas that you can actually change. There's help out there for you, um, that there are people uh, like, or organizations even like ASDA, like NAFA, um, individuals like myself and others who consult in these areas. Um, I do work with people in these areas who understand they have blind spots or weak spots. It's a reality. Um, find your community, find your people, uh, connect with them, care for them, share your weaknesses, share your strengths, share the ways in which you um, want to grow together and the ways you want to um, move in your activism. And then change the collective imagination. What can you dream together? What can you learn together? Um, how can you change things together? How can you acknowledge your weaknesses and find ways to build and shift things together? It's going to take all of us. It's def definitely going to take all of us. Again, just to speak to the um, our revised principles, visions, values, and the new health at every size framework of care, um, it's going to be revealed at our October education event. Very excited about that happening. Uh, please um, take a moment to visit ASDA.org to join us, um, to join ASDA. That's always a good thing, but also to stay in the loop um, to learn about our events and things that are coming up in this this year. Just want to share a few resources before we go into our um, question and answer period and I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, again, I've said it already, but Belly of the Beast by Deshaun L. Harrison, required reading. Um, Fearing the Black Body, uh, the Racial Origins of Fat Phobia, really want to drive home by Sabrina Strings, really want to drive home, do some research after you leave here today around the connection between um, uh, anti-blackness and fatness, fat phobia and blackness. These are all things that will help you become more inclusive and understand um, people like myself who say that if you really want to be doing this work, you absolutely must diversify the faces and the bodies that are shown on your social media feeds, shown in your marketing, um, because there's a connection between blackness and, and fatness that I know on a wide scale people don't really understand. Because if you did, you would realize how important it is to center the voices of especially fat black folks, because we do stand to, to be harmed the most by the medical and health industrial complex. Also, Fat Activism by um, Charlotte Cooper. These are all books um, uh, that are uh, very important to read and to use as resources um, and reference books as well. 
I'll show another um, a list here if you want to just take a moment to check these out. Um, response to fat white activism from people of color in the fat justice movement. Um, the ma mothers who fought the radically uh, reimagine welfare by to radically reimagine welfare by Jean Demby. More people should be fat. I mentioned that earlier. The fat underground video and fat manifesto. I mentioned that earlier. Um, health at every size seven part series by Barbara Bruno. Unpacking um, the health at every size principles again. We'll have a revision of those in October. Shout out on a tightrope. Fat studies reader. Uh, Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals by Alexis Pauline Crum. Unfolding Towards Repair, a workbook for community accountability facilitators by Marianne Kaba and Shira San. Thank you all so much. Um, we have about, I guess, about 15 minutes left for any observations, questions. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Angel. I'm looking at the chat here to see what folks have been writing in. Um, yeah, some great insights here. Um, I know I'm just kind of sitting and taking a lot of this in and wrote down mm. a lot of resources to check out. Um, I'd love to hear from folks in the chat if they have any specific questions for Angel. Now is definitely an awesome opportunity to be able to ask her. Um, Someone said, I'm new to Hayes. Taking small steps with medical providers for me is difficult, yet needs to be done. I'm more aware from this week and today of harsh realities and unacceptability of inequities, self-accountability for starters, self-examination of my implicit biases, awareness of intent versus impact, and challenging stigmas slash oppression within my circles. Um, yeah, folks commented on some of that iceberg of uh, white supremacy and... Mm -hmm culture with um, color blindness continues to be a big one that people think is fine but is so harmful. Um, some folks commented on haze. A lot of good, a lot of good comments. I am um, looking at the question about or the uh, question about stock images, and it's so funny because Lindley is a good resource. And I would love to see like a huge undertaking um, by this community to have um, more, like a huge library of stock images of fat people just doing normal everyday stuff. You know, yeah. <laughs> just normal everyday, like going to the grocery store or, you know, eating a meal or dancing or, you know, just, uh, any, any other type of stock image you see anywhere else doing, you know, for anyone. I use Canva a lot and it's horrible. The things you have to like put in Canva to try to find yes. for all like, of fat people. And it's so limited. It is so limited. And so many images of fat people without their heads, only their. Yeah. yeah it's just. Uh, Tony. Okay. I'm going to read this real quick. Uh, I want to know examples of commitments to make change to the landscape for those who suffer the most. I wrote down diversifying my feed and reading and learning from those. Uh, but there's anything else I can consider. Um, those are very good um, places to start. Um, I want to know. I want to know from the people here, like, when you go to do this work or you look out initially to learn, are you, and it's human nature, you don't, I mean, it's no, no, not a bad thing. It's human nature to look to people who look like you, right? It's human nature for us to uh, be connected or want to be close to or be drawn to people who look like us. But I want to know from you as a uh, marginalized, uh, multiply marginalized person, when that happens, um, how often, or, or like what's the process of you looking out for information? If not for someone like myself telling you you should, how does that generally work for you? 
Can anyone can, or I guess anyone can answer. You can answer in the chat. I forgot there's a webinar. <laughs> um, I'm just really curious about that. So the question is, how are folks accessing information and um, awareness about these issues without, you know, always being told to and waiting mm -hmm. you know, for something to happen or waiting to be told after something has happened um, by folks who then are putting in a lot of labor to do so? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if the answer is that you you don't <laughs> i mean that's fine too that's that's honest you know it's true it could be true um i just i guess what our work is as the and what my work is as an individual is to make that and this is not i'm not doing a correlation between police violence and this but my this i just stay stick with me here stick with me here okay you know how we learn that bias when there's a police violence uh, is like innate, right? Like you, it's in the moment, like there's not a, really a decision. It's almost like subconscious, you know, and before you know it, this thing is, you know, devolved and the things are going really bad. Bias in general is like that. So how do we um, essentially offset our bias or act in opposition of our bias when we're looking for information about these things or we're about to post something or we're about to do something um, that we, you know, feel is we want it to be inclusive maybe, or just when we're not even thinking about inclusivity at all, you know, like it's, it's our nature to do these things that come, you know, that are comfortable to us that we're used to, but how do we change that thinking pattern? How do we get into the groove, you know, of doing things differently? That's such a good question and point. I'm hearing in what you're saying, this importance mm -hmm. of almost like taking a pause mm -hmm. and checking ourselves before mm -hmm. we put things out there and before yeah. we publish things. And I noticed, I mean, I think when a lot more discussion was happening in 2020 and a lot more accountability, mm -hmm. it seemed like that was happening a bit more from yeah. an outside perspective that people were being much more conscious about what they mm -hmm. were posting online, thinking through things, highlighting mm -hmm. marginalized voices. And that was trendy for a while. Yeah. That was, mm -hmm. you know, and then I think that we should go back to some of that, you know, yeah. like I think we should yeah. be that pause and that moment of who am I centering right now? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's never a need to post something within five seconds of thinking about it. And yeah. I just, I think that that to me feels really important. Yeah, um, yeah, you're right about that. And it's that's been an issue in a lot of areas community wide that there's been such a departure from that thoughtfulness mm -hmm. and that taking a pause. It's just like not trending. It's not cool anymore. And that I mean, from mutual aid, because I do a lot of work in mutual aid to um, ASDA, you know, you know, funding, membership, um, I imagine that a lot of organizations that were really entrenched during that time and doing that active uh, ac activism work have experienced similar, very similar things. And I'm trying to figure out what it would take to get back, you know, to that. And it seems like it's situations like, you know, us being here, um, you know, other, you know, organizations or events, things like that, you know, just being aware to kind of like, I don't know, almost debrief or like reprogram, you know, the minds of people so that they begin to uh, think in those ways again. Um, the unfortunate thing is, and I talk again about the the way that fatness and blackness can't be separated, is that um, you have, uh, Sabrina Strings talks about this in, in, in her book about how the fact, and just very, to make it very simple, um, the way that white fat people are perceived in media, um, the origins of that come from how fat black people were perceived like during those times, right? And so the there's a trickle down effect, right? That I should say trickle up <laughs> effect that happens in our society that has been happening, 
you know, for centuries that the things that affect us that might not affect the most, the least uh, marginalized or the most privileged people will we, we'll begin to affect them as those of us who suffer most, suffer more. We see it happening in, in um, the economy. We see it happening in, you know, the worldview of, you know, you know wars and uh, things that are happening across the world. Like, more and more people are being affected. The rich are getting richer, right? But like there's such a, a, a disparity between the rich and you know the poor and the middle class, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we have to do something like we all are in this community together. And I think that people don't really understand the importance of uh, making this the priority now uh, before, I say it all the time with mutual aid, we're all going to need it at some point. Like we're, we're all going to be in a, a position where we're not going to be able to access things that we need, just like the most marginalized are not right now. So what are we going to do to fend that off? And it's going to take us to, you know, come into an understanding about community and how much we need each other, how much is required that we support each other, and the individualism and perfectionism. It has to. It has to stop. Yeah, it seems like a reframing of, you know, you need to do this, not because it's going to make you look good, not yeah. because it's even, you know, what you should be doing. Yeah. It's, you mm -hmm. should be doing this because this is where the work needs to be. This is yeah. centering the most marginalized people mm -hmm. will have a ripple out effect, yes, it will. you know, it will. and um, framing it as like a separate issue is not only mm -hmm. helping people who are most affected, but it's also not yeah. helping you. No, um, yeah. it's not. Yeah. It's not. We're responsible for each other, ultimately. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's some sort of self check-in that people can do to remind themselves of that. It makes me think about Sonia Renee Taylor talking about mm -hmm. um, like how body liberation and radical self-love is like learning a new language and you it have is. to translate things. And I just wonder if people need to check in with themselves more regularly and do some of that intentional translation. Yeah. yeah. I think these resources are awesome that, that I've shared and that y'all have been sharing this week. Um, and I think it would, you know, be good to have maybe a list. People have asked me even, you know, for a list of things I can do just to like run down you know, before I post this, so what do I need to consider here? You know, what do I need to do here? I think that would be something that we should work toward as a community, for sure, mm. for sure. That sounds so helpful. Yeah. yeah. We're coming up on our time here. I'm wondering what um, folks who are watching at home or might be feeling, thinking, um, if there's any key takeaways that you might want to share, um, something that's on your mind or on your heart. Thank you. And if you all want to um, reach out to me, my email was added to the chat earlier. It's angel at asa.org. Um, if you want to discuss this further, if you have any additional questions or things you just want to talk about, you could always reach me there. I'm happy to, to talk with you all. Uh, thank you, Shannon. I hope it's been um, helpful to y'all today. And um, yeah, check us out at ASDA. Check out um, ASDA.org. We have a lot of uh, things coming up, uh, awesome events coming up this year that speak to these things specifically in ways that you all can uh, get a better, a better handle on these things and uh, actually see some things change for uh, folks uh, in the medical. It, it's horrible. We, we didn't even, couldn't even, that's a whole other presentation. <laughs> that's a whole other presentation. How horrible it is for especially those who are the most more marginalized. But um, we're working diligently to change those things and want uh, as many people as possible to be part, to take part in that with us. What a wonderful resource we have as a community in ASDA. Mm -hmm. Second that everybody join attend the events, watch the recording. Yes, yes for sure. Uh, 
Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, it's a lot, Lauren. A lot to process. I understand. I knew it was when I shared it. <laughs> I knew it was when I shared it, but it's necessary, necessary information. I feel like I could spend a whole day processing each one of those slides yeah. and reading about them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. We're coming out to the end of the hour here. Um, and I want to respect Angel's time and everybody's time here. Um, definitely feel free to check out your attendee dashboard for CEs and, and um, a survey about the webinars. Um, and reach out to Angel or um, any of the folks involved. Okay. Y'all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for having me again.